Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 256. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and in this episode, we are going to get together with one of genealogy's favorite fiction writers, Nathan Dylan Goodwin. Nathan is a native of the famed battle town of Hastings, England, and he has a degree in radio, film, and television studies, and a master's in creative writing. After publishing a few nonfiction books, he turned to fiction and brought us the beloved forensic genealogist Morton Ferrier in a very popular series of books that includes The Lost Ancestor, Hiding the Past, and The Asylum. In his recent book, The Chester Creek Murders, he introduces us to Madison Scott Barnhart. Now, she works for Venator, a company that uses cutting-edge investigative genetic genealogy to profile perpetrators solely from DNA evidence. This conversation comes from episode 47 of Elevens is with Lisa, my weekly live show on the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. But we're bringing the audio to you here today so you can listen on the go. So without further ado, let's chat with Nathan Dylan Goodwin. I don't remember if we crossed paths at Roots Tech a year ago. Yes, yes, yes. We did in person because yes. the the trip that was really on my mind was just prior to that, we both spoke at the genealogy show in Birmingham, yes. England. It was so good to see you there. How have you been, my friend? Yes, good, thank you. Yes, yeah, so the schools went back on Monday, so I've got a bit more writing time now that homeschooling is finished. Wow, good. So the kids are going back to school. Yes. Awesome. So I just want to jump in and, and talk with you about the book, Congratulations on another new book. I don't know how you put them out so quickly. How do you do that? And you've and you've had all this craziness going on for the last yeah. year. Yeah, I just I, I suppose it's because I just love doing it. I really love love it. So um, yeah, it's been a challenging year, I have to say. But um, I started this book actually this time last year, just after we got back from Roots Tech, and then when the lockdown happened. Um, I paused on the Chester Creek murders and just put it to one side and then did uh, Morton in lockdown. So I kind of had a little break and then came back to it. So, yeah, I think, yeah, it's just I love it so much. Well, I'm kind of curious. Are you one of those crime podcast junkies? That's the big craze now is everybody's listening to these crime stories on podcasts. Are you one of those? I have to say I've been listening to quite a few. Yes. And <laughs> I'm interested in them anyway, but I do then think, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And, you know, pick up some uh, points for future books, potentially. Yeah. So I am enjoying some. Yes. Well, this one, um, th this is a little bit of a departure in that you really get inside the head of the criminal, which is kind of, uh, tell us about that. Is that hard to write in that kind of detail about the way a criminal thinks? It is. It's very hard because I haven't actually committed murder myself just yet. So um, that's not part of your hard. research, huh? No, I don't go, go that ahead. far. Um, yeah, it is difficult actually because you're kind of having to. It's just something that's so out of. That's why it's so interesting. It's so out of normality, isn't it? You know, and I try to think what may what makes these people do this and behave in this way, um, and yeah, it's quite it's quite tricky to. Uh, to get inside the, the killer's head. I didn't do it too, too much. I, the, their chapter, the chapters where it's with the serial killer, it's kind of, they're quite short. And um, and I have had some people read it and say, oh, it's, you know, sometimes a bit too much, but uh, I tried not to go, to go too far there because really the book's about solving, trying to solve the crime rather than the actual crime itself. So I don't go into the actual murders themselves. It's kind of seeing the, the killer just afterwards and then um, later on in the book as well. Well, I suppose though it's it's key. You have to do it to a certain extent. Otherwise it really doesn't drive home the point as to why this work is so critical yes. that's being done. And um, the new technology that like DNA that's being used to solve cold cases. I'd love to take a step back and, and talk about how you get ready to write a book like this. I mean, we're, I want to talk about writing in general, but first, I mean, there's a lot of research that goes into this, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same that with any of my books. If I get the research right, then the actual writing process is much smoother and simpler. So I always spend kind of up to three months on, on the research side of things. So 
um, the research for this one came about, it must have been two years ago now, um, when I was in Salt Lake City, actually. And it was just after the Golden State Killer had been caught using this technology. And I thought it'd be really interesting to write a book using that, you know, that kind of a fictionalised version of that. Um, and I thought, what better place to, to set the, the team than in Salt Lake City, especially as it's somewhere, you know, I, I go quite regularly. So that's where the team are based, but the crimes, they, they can take place all over the US. Um, and so, yeah, I did lots of location-based research whilst out there and obviously had to go and explore lots of cafes and restaurants and things like that. And had to go skiing in Park City to make sure that was accurate. Um, and then I did a lot of work on um, the DNA side of things because they're, they're using this investigative genetic genealogy to solve the crime. So... And that needed to be right, you know, really right. So um, I did lots of work on my own um, DNA and I have already helped in the past three adoptees find birth parents. And the principle really is quite similar, you know, in that you don't have this, you have the DNA, you don't know anything about the parents and you've got to build trees from it. Um, so I did quite a bit of that. And then also I took a course on um, genetic uh, genealogy and basically it's a course that's it's really offered to law enforcement so that they can kind of get a better understanding of this technology and to start to use it in-house rather than have to use these companies so um and finally i spoke um to barbara ray venter who was one of the principal genealogists who solved the golden state case and so i spoke to her and kind of put her loads and loads of questions about well, how did you do and what did you you know, and um, it's such it's such a new thing that actually you're kind of free to really do what I want. You know, I'm saying, you know, do people work, do you work by yourself or do you work as a team? And is it remote or are you in one office? And she was kind of like, well, some people are by themselves. Some people are working in an office. And so, you know, do, do it as you as you please, really. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of research. I really needed to get, get all that uh, correct, you know, so that it would stand up as a real uh, methodology, really. Well, let's break a little bit of that down. Now, you sent me some pictures. It looks like you're at your happy place at the Family History Library. That's a tough place to do research. What a hard job you have. I mean, it, but you did it for us anyway, didn't you? Did. Yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of, this is the thing. A lot of it is research for the book, but a lot of it's actually just my personal, I want to do it for myself anyway. So having that opportunity to whilst out at Roots Tech um, to, to sell the books and everything, I thought, you know, I'm going to go to the Family History Library, yes, for research from the book, but also a bit of stuff, uh, time for myself. And to, to cause it's funny because living in Kent, if I want to look at records, say, for um, my Buckinghamshire uh, ancestors, for example, it was easier to do it out there than it would be for me, you know, to have to go to Buckinghamshire. So, yeah, I did a bit of my own research and a bit of work for the book. Isn't that interesting? You have to come to the, coming to the U.S., you actually have greater access yeah, to a lot yeah. of the stuff that you really need. Yeah. You have the bike, or I guess, are these scooters? They have scooters. these down all over the streets in, in Salt Lake City, don't they? Yes, yeah. They're just, yeah, when, I think the first year I went out, I saw these scooters just lying around on the pavement. So I was thinking, what, why are these, why has someone left them, just dumped them and walked away? And then the second year, I kind of looked into it a bit more and, um, and then found that you could actually hire them and, you know, you hire them for as long as you need and then you literally just leave them somewhere um, and then people just pick them up. And so, um, yeah, I re rented one for an afternoon and buzzed around the city and it was, it was good fun, but you're supposed to not go on the pavement, you're supposed to go on the, stay on the roads. And I don't know, it was quite dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of going slowly on the pavement for nobody around and then buzz onto the road a bit, but uh, it was good fun. Yeah. Well, you know, my husband, Bill, started reading your book, too. And he, and he looks at me and goes, wow, he's really nailed Salt Lake City. I mean, that's what it feels like. You really had it. And, and then that really adds so much to the story as you help immerse all of us is you've done that homework so you can really bring us along and describe it. And if you haven't had the opportunity to go to Salt Lake City and the, and the Family History Library, boy, you sure feel like you've been there. Uh, and there's the Kearns building and you've placed the company Venator there. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we were looking around and trying to find somewhere that would be suitable. And um, that building with its history and the fact that it was obviously right on Main Street in, in, the, in the city centre, it just looked really perfect. And I, I couldn't really tell what the building was used for. And so 
I kind of opened the door and just looked inside and it just there were some elevators and the stairs and so I just started wandering around and looking and um, I did get a security guard kind of looking at me strangely because I was, I was going down into the basement into the garage there and um, he was kind of like, yeah, what are you doing? Like, just looking, thanks. And then just carry, you know, as if I had some right to be there, you know. And, um, and I thought, yeah, this is a good building because each floor has got different companies on it. So it's perfectly feasible that um, they could have the top floor there and uh, to go about their business. So, yeah, it's a good building. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the security guard thinks your case in the joint, right? You know, yeah, <laughs> for your so. own activities there. It was interesting. You know, you, it kind of did read a little bit like insider baseball in terms of, uh, that's a term, I don't know if you do that in England, but we say that in the U.S., insider baseball is, you know, having a real firsthand knowledge kind of behind the scenes. And you bring that both to the criminal cold case side, as well as the DNA. And um, just for anybody who isn't by chance, I don't know if there's anybody who's not familiar with the Golden State Killer case, but that was out in California. And I lived out there. I lived in Modesto, the town where he first started. And um, I remember as a kid, that was a big deal. I mean, we all heard about these different crimes and it was decades. Mm-hmm. And eventually they discovered that having DNA from one of those crime scenes and putting that into many of the genealogy databases, of course, they were able to build out trees to finally trace down to, to catch up with him. You said that you interviewed Barbara and I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about what was that like? Because you really did get a firsthand kind of behind the scenes look that you've shared a lot in the book, but um, it must have been fascinating to talk to her about that work. Yes, it, it really was. Um, yeah, she was obviously very, very knowledgeable and um, very humble as well. You know, she wasn't really, I kind of had to dig a bit with my questioning, you know, about <laughs> what, what I wanted. And I think at first she was like, what, what, why are you asking me all these questions? You know, and I was trying to say, I'm writing a book, it's going to be, you know, based on that. So, yeah, it was, it was more, I was more asking about the, the actual methodology of things. And I was saying, so how do you, questions like, how do you get the, your, the DNA? You know, is it that law enforcement passes it to you and you then give it to the company or do they go straight to the company? Um, and so she was talking about how basically through family tree DNA, the law enforcement, they send their, the, the sample to be tested at family tree DNA. Um, and she was telling me all the pricing, you know, like $700 just for the autosomal results. But if you want the Y test as well, then it goes up to $1,000. And then the the company is then given the results as anybody else's. You know, they like to log in details. And so they log in and they've got access to details. And they Are those then... prices because it's for this type of work? Yes, because it's for specifically oh. for law enforcement. Okay. Um, yeah, and so she's telling me like the turnaround time and that kind of thing. Um, and the fact that once it's on Family Tree DNA, they can then download that from there to put it on to GEDmatch. I think there were the cheaper prices if they went straight to GEDmatch, but then, um, yeah, that's generally the way the way it was done. And she was telling me about, you know, she basically, she would take on any case, no matter um, how low the centimorgan matches were. So she has lots and lots of cases that at the moment are just sitting sort of waiting because they're just, they're a bit too complicated at the moment. It's just, you know, the closest match is just too small. So it's kind of waiting for a bigger match to come in or a bit more time to focus on that. So she's, I think she said she had something like 11 cases on the go at any one time that mm-hmm. she's working on. And she do, she does um, free uh, you know, pro bono work for the Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, you know, where they've got um, ch- uh, remains of children who they don't know who they are. And so she does work for them. And so, yeah, I pulled a lot of that into, into the, into the research. So it was really fascinating speaking to her because it was just, it would just added that authenticity to, you know, to this, to the process really. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine knowing that autosomal goes back, what, six generations. I mean, if you had a five generation match, that would be a bear to try to build out a tree all the way coming forward, almost impossible. So they're really looking for those closest one level, two level type matches, right? Yes, they are. Yeah. But she won't turn them down if they're too far. She'll just kind of have to just sit on it and just tell, you know, tells them it's just have to wait for a bit. So hopefully they'll get there in the end. One of the things that you mentioned in the book was that, and I was going to ask you, is this true? 1% of cold criminal cold cases are solved in the US? Yes, that is true. Very, wow. very sad. But I mean... I think that's going to start changing, though, because of 
genetic genealogy because they, their, their success rates are something like 80 something percent at the moment. So that's a huge number moving forwards in these various companies. Um, so hopefully, yeah, that statistic will start to be a bit more positive, really. <laughs> And did you did good. you have a chance to talk to criminal detectives for in yeah. preparation for this book? I'd be interested to know about that too. Yeah, so I spoke to um, there's about three that I had that I was speaking to in different parts of the US. It's quite interesting actually how they differ in their approaches. And so, for example, the there's a scene at the end of the book. Um, I can't give too much away, but um, I can't. I don't know how to say it without giving it away. But there's a scene <laughs> basically where um, there's the police involved in trying to catch somebody and um, one detective said absolutely you would that would not happen you wouldn't do that and another detective said oh yes that's totally totally plausible and yes we've done that so I did actually use it in, in the book um, and the scenes at the very beginning when um, Clayton Tyler the detective He's in his basement in the police department building and he's looking at all the cold cases they've got there um, and he's choosing which one, you know, to pick. But all of that information about the public disclosure records and the fact that they have to keep reviewing their cold cases because otherwise um, journalists can ask for information about them. All of that basically came from, uh, from a detective and is all that's all true, that information. So wow, it's very fascinating. fascinating. Because it's something, I, there's no way on earth I would have known that or been able to, to research that, you know, that, yeah, so they have these PDRs, they're called. So journalists can write to any police department and say, we'd like, in, like information on all of your cold, inactive cases. So the way they get around that is to then open them up again and review them. And if, if there's a chance of them being solved, then they'll give it a high solvability and they'll then try in the, you know, to, to bring some fresh evidence to this and, and try and solve it. And so that's fascinating because, you know, I watch a lot of true crime. I don't listen to the podcast as much as I do a <laughs> podcast. Um, I watch a lot of the true crime television shows. They have a whole channel for that here in the US. You probably get it in the UK. I often wondered, you know, they say, oh, we opened this case or that case. It was 35 years old. And you were like, what prompted you to do that? But you've just really given an insider look to that because it's that putting it in active status so that you don't have mm -hmm. to necessarily um, yeah. answer a whole bunch of questions about it to the press. I mean, he did say like it's <clears throat> the reason they don't, they don't do it to stop the journalists having access. They just think that if a journalist starts running a story about it, there's less chance of it actually being solved because now it's you know it's all over Netflix or it's uh, in a mm. newspaper or, or whatever. So. Um, they do have to review them. So yeah, all that all of that information about the cold cases and the, the kind of the numbers in the, the they go back to 1900 in their vaults, you know, the, the, the date wise. And so all of that information I got from yeah, real real US detectives. And I think that's probably a little bit of why the Golden State Killer case came to prominence and got worked as hard as it did, because there was um, a writer who was absolutely obsessed with the case and kept writing about it and kept bringing it up and gave it that kind of exposure. Well, it's interesting. You have produced a lot of books and you talked about going to the Family History Library and getting a chance to do some of your own research too. Um, do you get to do much of your own genealogy research these days? Not as much as I would like. Um, I, I try to do a little bit every week if I can do, yeah. So, um, it just, so I, I would love to just sit down. I'm, I'm down in my cabin now and um, this is where I do my, my writing down the bottom of the garden. And I would love to just come down and sit here and do my family tree. And it does get very tempting, especially as I have to use all these databases for, for the for the more Immortan books and for the, the Maggie books. So I'm constantly on Ancestry and Find My Past and My Heritage and Family Tree, you know, and Family Search. I'm constantly on them. I'm thinking, oh, I've got a message. Let me just look at what that is. And then you know what it's like. You go down a rabbit hole and suddenly you're... So yes, I do do, um, I do, do my own work quite regularly. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a balance, isn't it? I, I have the same issue here with doing this show is that um, it's so easy to push mine aside because I'm trying to juggle all these other yeah. things. And yet that research is essential to yeah. staying abreast of what's going on and the newest things and, and being able to bring 
challenges I'm facing. I know two people who are watching are probably having the same challenges and you're bringing, um, you know, fascinating stories and you weave genealogical research into all of these books. I, I got emails from people saying, oh my gosh, you know, Nathan helped me solve something or Nathan brought, <laughs> made me aware of DNA. And now I'm finding out, you know, who my grandmother was. And it's just been amazing the way you can touch lives with that kind of work. Do you get that kind of feedback from your readers? I do, yes. I get a lot of that. Yeah, which is really, really lovely. And that's why I'm really keen and careful to get that research right. So that if I'm saying, obviously the content of a lot of the, the records is are fictionalized to suit the story, but I try to really make sure that the records that Morton is using or Maddie is using in this case, um, that they're real and that they're, if I say they're online, then they're online. Or if I say you have to go to a library, that's where you have to go for them. And I do get very frequent um, messages and emails from people saying, you know, that it's opened up a new area of research and they found this person because of uh, the book. So it's really good, really good to hear. Well, I put it out on Instagram and Facebook that we were doing this uh, interview and heard from lots of people. Jasmine, her, she goes by Jasmine Pie One on Instagram. She says, I capital letters, love his books. Thank you for writing such interesting and thoughtful commentaries on genealogy and crime. We'll have more from Nathan Dylan Goodwin right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. MyHeritage has developed powerful genealogy tools to enrich your family tree and take your research to the next level. Receive automatic matches to family trees of fellow MyHeritage users and historical records, which provide new details that you can add to your tree. Explore 12 billion historical records to uncover fascinating new insights about your ancestors. Add new information to your family tree in one click. Check your tree for inaccuracies, colorize your black and white photos, and connect with relatives around the globe. MyHeritage makes it all possible and puts the discoveries at your fingertips. I've been colorizing some of my own personal family photos, and not only are they beautiful, but in many of the photos, it's actually been revealing more detail so I can see more of my family history. Growing your family tree is easier than ever before with MyHeritage. The discoveries are out there and waiting to be made. Visit MyHeritage.com and try it today. That's MyHeritage.com. And now back to our conversation with Nathan Dylan Goodwin. I had a question from a listener I'd love to um, ask you about. Mr. Gene 61 says, I've loved Morton's stories and his genealogical methodology. Uh, Morton Verrier, right? So do you have a new adventure planned for him? I bet you get that question a lot. I do, yeah. As soon as I finish one, it's like, when's the next one? <laughs> and now I get people saying, um, I, want, I want the next Maddie, but I want the next Morton, so just hurry up and get on with it. Um, yes, I do. I'm writing it right now. Um, I'm about halfway through, and um, every third book, so The Orange Lily is uh, The Missing Man, and this one I'm writing now, they're slightly shorter in length, which means it will be out sooner. Um, but they're more focused on Morton's uh, backstory and his life. So that's the one I'm working on right now. Um, and I'm hoping, because I'm about halfway there and go, getting through it quite quickly, um, hoping it'll be out kind of autumn time. But don't hold me to that because I'm terrible at <laughs> doing that. <laughs> it'll be out at Christmas and it's not out at Christmas. So um, it'll be out sometime this year anyway. I remember you talking in Birmingham about the origins of Morton and of your writing. I'd love to have you share kind of not only how you got started in, in this kind of writing, but also how Morton came to be and what almost happened to him. <laughs> so um, I started, as you said, I started with nonfiction writing, um, first of all, and I really loved the writing process. And so on the back of that, I did a master's degree in creative writing. And I think it was very, it was very early on in the course and I started to think about doing a detective book but where the detective is a genealogist and has to solve a crime in the past but using genealogy and um, so that's kind of where, where Morton first came from and I kept writing it and it was at the time when genealogy was really getting more and more popular and who do you think you are was on telly and that kind of thing and um, yeah my classmates were very 
supportive of it and very positive and they said yeah keep writing so the, the course was two years part-time and so I just kept writing more and more and more and more of it um, and actually on the, the the book that I had it wasn't really a book by the time it wasn't finished but by the time the course finished I was thinking it would be just a, a one-off kind of standalone project and I actually had Morton I was going to kill him off and I do I remember my <laughs> I remember some of the people in the course saying well, don't do that just in case like you know it could become a series and um I think as well people over the years have said like his and Juliet's relationship has got a lot closer and um a bit like some people have read just the first just hide in the past and said oh she's not very nice to him and I think it's because I thought he was going to die so it was a one-off it didn't really didn't really matter how what their relationship was you know um and uh so I'm, I'm very glad obviously that I didn't I didn't kill him off, and um, but I put the book to one side, and I didn't actually try to get it published. That was in 2009. I finished the degree, and I then just went into um, becoming a primary school teacher, <laughs> as you do, and um, and just didn't think and think too much of it. And then I read uh, Steve Robinson's first book, which is another genealogical crime mystery. It's the first one I'd ever read, and I thought, I thought, wow, there's a there's a market here for this. This is good. I'll get uh, Hide in the Past out and, um, you know, finish it basically and edit it. And so I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning before doing a day's teaching and I would do an hour of, um, and that was really tough, I have to say. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a morning person, but I'm not at five o'clock in the morning <laughs> in the cold and the dark in winter, um, putting my dressing gown on and <laughs> going in and just trying to, you know, so, but I did it and, um, finished the book and yet yeah, published in 2013 and well haven't looked back really wow <laughs> we well, we're, we're, we're all very glad that you didn't kill off morton Ferrier yeah. because <laughs> he went on to have many books and of course i i, I really have always said I, I, this isn't just my opinion that everything's about relationships if it's business yeah. if it's school if it's writing if it's making a video it's all about the relationships it's and the relationships that you write about help people connect with those characters and therefore connect with your book. I think, you know, a, a really fascinating crime story is great, but not if I don't care about anybody who's involved. And so you've got Madison, uh, who's a lead character in the Chester Creek murders, and um, she has her own issues as well. Do you give a lot of thought to the relationships or just the connection of the audience with these characters while you're also trying to Put together these complicated mysteries. Yeah, that is that is really important because I think the, the the reader really needs to at least empathise. Obviously, that's what another reason I kept the serial killer chapters quite short because I'm not expecting someone to go, oh, he's nice, you know, <laughs> or, you know, he's killed a few women. But apart from that, he's a lovely guy. Um, I'm not expecting that, so it's very important for the rest of the book then that people do care about Maddie and her she's got this this small team that she's got with the three other main characters um that they at least even if they think they don't particularly like her um they at least empathize with her and get her situation understand her but yeah the idea is that a reader will will like her and and the rest of the team as well they've all got their you know uh, foibles and um flaws but uh, hopefully people will, will will like them and I do spend again, time in that research period, trying to figure out the family situations and the relationships and because they've got to be believable people as well, you know, so you can sort of relate to them and to understand them better is also helpful with the writing, how they're going to deal with situations that they're, they're facing. So yeah, I do, that's very important. I bet, it's a lot like acting. I did a lot of acting in uh, my younger years, and you had to know the backstory, even if it's never going to come up in the the play or whatever it is you're doing, you have to kind of know so that you get how they're going to respond. And I imagine that there are backstories to Clayton and to Madison that you probably have to kind of plan out. And do, how far in advance do you plan multiple books in advance? I do. Um, so with, uh, with the Maddie and uh, her team, so I've I've already, as I was writing that book, I was thinking of the, the next book. And so I've already got the ideas. I know very much I, I could um, pretty well start it, you know, today if I, if I wanted to. Um, with Morton, I usually am about two or three books in advance. So oh. I'm currently halfway through book nine, but 
I've got a very good idea and his kind of subplot about his own family life for 10 and 11 and kind of a vague idea for 12. So, yeah, but it's good to have that as well, because then as um, as I'm writing, and I, I come across records or things in my own research. And I think, oh, that would work for that book in, you know, another two years time. It gives me time to then, um, yeah, consider these things a bit more and add to them rather than, you know, blank page and what am I writing, you know? Now, do you fashion some of these, maybe not the character, but the, the personalities of the different characters? Do you fashion them after people that you know? Is there a Nathan somewhere in one of these books? <laughs> well, Morton, Morton started that way and um, as a bit of me. Um, but my um, tutor on the, on the creative writing course, he said, don't base a character on you because actually you'll, um, you'll make them not very nice because you'll think you don't want people to think oh they're such a nice character and they're based on you and, and so you'll then go the opposite way and you'll make them not very nice because you'll think I don't want people to think that I'm that nice and he just said don't do that and so I'm, I'm glad he said it because I listened and then kind of separated him so he's now just like a very good friend or like a brother I know exactly what he's thinking and how he'll how he'll behave but and he drives the car I want and he lives in the house I want um, but um, apart from that, he's not. So our other characters, I kind of, I see the person, Maddie's physical appearance was actually based on somebody, I was at the National Trust property um, called Sissinghurst a few years back when the idea was fermenting in my brain, you know, and I hadn't started writing it. And I just saw this lady um, and she just had this, she had a trilby hat on and she was probably in her mid forties and she had short blonde hair and she just struck me. She just looked quite um, striking. And I thought she looks like I think Maddie would look, you know, with this kind of ripped jeans and kind of don't, don't really care what she, doesn't care what she looks like and, you know, a bit fierce. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's Maddie. So yeah, I pick, I pick bits of people I see and, but there's nobody that a character is specifically based on apart from Miss Latimer, the archivist in the Morton books, who's always a bit mean to him. She's a real person. Interesting. So, the, so this other gal was walking around. She doesn't know she's walking around in a book as Maddie. No, no, no. I um, yeah, I, I surreptitiously took a photo of her, but she doesn't know. Oh, how fun. oh, how fun! Now, Amy, she left a comment. She says, "I I would like to know how can we best integrate a feeling of compelling mystery into our own family history writing?" And I know a lot of people are watching. They want to write too, but they do want to make it interesting and I heard from many people that they actually have mysteries in their writing do you have any advice where you know they can stick to the truth but they can make it a little more compelling particularly for non-genealogists in their family who normally hear genealogy and they go running for the hills but we want to write something that will as Amy says kind of make them feel compelled to want to continue to read I guess, I guess if you're wanting to not fictionalise, you want to tell a real story of your real ancestors, um, the way I would go about it would be to have, have all your, um, your sources and things, but put, really push them to the back as end notes. So I, I think sometimes with genealogy, we have a tendency to say, this person was born on the 17th of March, 1652, <laughs> and he was baptised in this church, and on this census, he, and it gets quite... Okay, it's a bit, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit boring. But you need those sources, obviously. So, I would say go for the thing that you think is really interesting about this about this person that you've got, or your, this part of your tree, um, and then really try and sort of jazz that up without making it fictionalised, obviously. And then put the these the boring, the dry bits, put them into end notes so that if people want to know, well, how do you know that they were born on this date? You know, put that as an end note, and then try and look at, into their lives a bit more around it. So look at newspapers and what's going on at the time period and look at what their kind of was, was happening around them in, in history. Um, and then hook, find, find that hook, whatever it is um, that you've got, that you're going to, if it's a murder or something, then obviously that's quite a big thing. And perhaps start with a sort of a cliffhanger moment, you know, in, introduce a paragraph of this person committed murder or was murdered read on to find out kind of thing, you know, and then you can say where they were born and how they came in to be in those circumstances. It's a tricky one because you don't want to go into the realms of fiction and start to make, you know, make things up because you don't know what 
they said or, or whatever. But um, yeah, that would be my would be my advice there. And it seems like it would be fair to, in that kind of writing, if you have a good sense of what you think might have happened or how that person might have, you can say it, but we could say it within, this is our, you know, I, t- I tend to envision it this way, or I can't help sure. but think, right? Couldn't we give, give some of that maybe, but just uh, couch it in the idea that this is just my opinion, but one can't help but wonder. I think I think as long as you you need to think, make sure you understand what who your audience is going to be, and with you know to make sure you're saying this isn't trying to be exactly exactly completely what was said. If you're if you're upfront about that, then I think yeah, you can definitely do that because yeah, why not? It makes it more, much more fun, doesn't it, to the for mm-hmm. the reader? I think. Well, and that's a really good point is knowing your audience. Um, I I tend to uh, teach a lot about creating short little family history videos, which is really storytelling just in a visual format. And of course, I think the number one thing we can do is do it for our audience, not for us. I mean, the for us, for the genealogist is all that data that you're talking about. But for the other audience, the family, it's got to be something else. I know you, you spend time with your audience, don't you, like on social media? And how much do you keep the audience in the forefront of your mind as you're writing? It's a tricky one because um, I know I know what the audience are looking for. And so I kind of, you know, I know that they're asking for, they want obviously the genealogical crime to be going on in, in the middle of it. They also want to see Morton at home with Juliet and the family. And mm-hmm. so I do, I do have it in mind, but um, I try to just tell the story that, that, that I want to, to tell. And I mean, when I wrote the Chester Creek murders, obviously I didn't have a, an audience in mind because I didn't know who would, I, obviously I hoped that my regular readers would read that one too, but um, it being such a different book and quite unique, I think, I don't think anybody else has done anything along those lines yet. So it's very difficult to, um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a balance really, having in mind what they would want to see and then, putting my own thing down that I know I would like to tell, yeah. You can't always deliver exactly what they're looking for, even if they <laughs> desperately want it, because then it's not, it's too predictable. Yeah. Um, which kind of brings me to, where do you get ideas? I know for a genealogist, of course, one of the challenges is just looking through this whole tree and deciding where to start. You probably have a lot of ideas coming at you. How do you pick one? What do you look for in an idea or a new technology or a new strategy that you're hearing about that people are using in genealogy and you say, that's that's something I want to write about? It's usually something that makes me interested. That's what it is. I think, ah, because I've been, I've been doing my family tree since I was 12. And so I, I know kind of, you know, I've, I've dealt with lots and lots of um, research over, over that time. And um, it's, it's if something now strikes me as, oh, that's an interesting story, then I think that's ve- therefore very likely to make other people in, also interested. Um, so, for example, with the Chester Creek um, murders, obviously it was the uh, the capture of the Golden State Killing. And I thought, wow, that's huge. You know, it's ne- this has never happened before that someone's been caught using um, using DNA and and using genealogy, so that was obviously a very big catalyst for that book. But the other the books in the Morton series, they tend to be things that I come across, and it can be doing my own family tree research. It can be on the on the news, all kinds of things. So the Sterling affair, the most recent uh, Morton book, that was just from an email from the National British National Archives. And it was basically that there was a release of new spy documents because they obviously closed for a very long time for obvious reasons. Um, and I thought, ah, oh, that would be a really good book because it's it's very much, you know, suited to this genre. Somebody who's a spy and pretending to be someone they're not and going under a false name. Um, and so I thought, oh, that'd be really interesting. I started to look then at these new records that were released from MI5 and MI6 and started to get an idea that perhaps if someone pretended to be someone they weren't and uh, Morton had some DNA that he could work with and try to work out who they really were and the story behind behind their spying yes like it really can come from anywhere and everywhere and um, the, the story of like um, the spyglass fire for example that was very very loosely based on my grandmother's story because she gave birth to an illegitimate child in the second world war and that's the, the kind of the, the premise of, of the spyglass file. 
So yeah, it's really, really anywhere and everywhere. So I've got, I've got a notes file on my phone. So if I'm out and about um, and something occurs to me, then I'll put it in the file. But if it's a, a, like a news story or something, then I've got that uh, an, a big file on my, on my um, computer as well. So I've got, I've got millions of ideas. <laughs> Lots of them don't, don't see the light of day because they don't quite, I can't quite build a story around it. So it hasn't, it's got to be more than just an interesting story by itself. I've got to be able to make a whole book out of, <laughs> out of that. So yeah, anywhere and everywhere is a short answer to that. You know, it strikes me as you're talking about this, Nathan, that, um, you know, you're getting ideas and I see how quickly the books come out. They're very thorough. You do your research. I get the sense you're just one of these people who, and, and it's a rare quality, I think, um, who doesn't wait. Like you seem to jump. And when you see something, you trust yourself enough to say, I got to run with that. And I got to do it now because there could be 10 more books coming on this. I would imagine if you waited five years, I know I'm a little bit like that, that as things are coming, it's like, it needs to happen now. And you have the discipline to get up every morning and to sit down and to write. Is that, is that just inborn or did you train yourself to be more diligent and persistent about those things that mattered to you that you wanted to accomplish like writing books? It's a good question. I don't know. I, I've never had it before now that, that, that there's something just, it's, it absolutely is. I, I never, ever have a Sunday night. Oh, I've got to go to work tomorrow. I never have that. Mm-hmm. I have the opposite. I have the opposite. If I don't work, you know, because I'm doing other things, decorating or, you know, on holiday or something, I'm thinking I need to get back to my writing. You know, I want to do this. But it has grown and I do trust myself much more now. I think when I was first writing, I kind of needed to know, well, where's this going to go? And I need to know exactly the whole structure. But now I kind of trust myself. Safety, right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Whereas now I kind of trust myself. And that's why I paused on, even though I was desperate to get the Chester Creek murders written, I paused when the coronavirus hit. And I thought, this is my one opportunity to talk about Morton in lockdown and what he's doing and um and, so, and i wanted to do and i thought i'm gonna do something completely different as well and so i came up with a web-based interactive story and it's kind of like a choose your own adventure so there's a it's on it's on my website and you read a section of text of story and then you have to say what morton's going to do next at each point which it was a bit of a nightmare to to <laughs> plot that because it was huge you know for every piece of text, you're given two or three choices. And it's a cool them. idea. Yeah. And, it, and it's the first opportunity that I've had to put uh, hyperlinks into real documents and real photos. And, and so I really thought, I've, got, I've just got to do this. I can't look back in a couple of years. I mean, I have to say, I thought the pandemic would be over much sooner. Not that we would still be sitting in it a year later, but I thought this is my one chance to, to do something. And so... Yeah, I just trusted myself and and went with it and did it. But um, yeah, it's kind of it's it's got I've got more disciplined, but not in a um, a forced way. Just that just is I want to get up and I want to get writing, and so I just do just get get on with it purely because I just love doing it. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Well, I so appreciate having you here today. I know a lot of the things that we've been talking about, um, several of your past books, we've had you on the Genealogy Gems podcast and featured you in the book club. And um, so I'm going to put some links in the show notes for this episode so everybody can come and kind of get up to speed with some of those books if by chance they miss them. And um, of course, a link over to your website. It's just NathanDillonGoodwin.com, correct? That's right. Yes. Awesome. So um, you said that currently, tell us again what your current project is. What, what will we see next from Nathan? So more, more to nine, hopefully about, about autumn time. Yeah, you'll have more to now. And then probably it will be then on to back onto Maddie again. Ah, excellent. Well, again, right now, this is the book. It's the Chester Creek Murders. And I'm going to have a link uh, also in the show notes so that you can grab a copy of that. We always appreciate when you guys use our links, which kind of helps support this free show and makes it all possible. Nathan, it's such a joy to talk to you. And I, you know, next time we got to do this in person, I hope it's very soon. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 256. And if you'd like to learn more about Nathan and see the show notes for this episode, or even watch the video interview that we did, head on over to genealogygems.com. And under Genealogy Gems podcast, go to episode 256. And you can go straight to the video version of this interview by going to uh, the Elevenses with Lisa page and clicking on episode 47. Thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.